You ask, we answer. Welcome to Can This Marriage Be Saved, where we go up against common relationship problems and help you determine if this relationship should stay or go. Hi, everybody, and welcome to this week's episode of Can This Marriage Be Saved? Um, I'm Rivka Slatkin. And I'm Shlomo Slatkin. And together we're here with Laura Doyle, who I'm going to read her wonderful introduction because she's very well known, and I want to make sure I get all of her amazing accomplishments um, to you. Laura Doyle's marriage was in trouble. After five years, her husband had become distant and seemed checked out of their relationship, preferring to wa- watching TV to making love. There were frequent fights that ended with tense silences. Marriage counseling made their problems worse. Each ses- session seemed to reinforce the feeling that she and her husband were just too far apart. Desperate to avoid divorcing the man she loved, Laura tried something different. She started to talking to women who'd been happily married for more than 15 years. What she discovered shocked her. Everything she had heard in marriage counseling was wrong. Laura realized there are basic truths that can help women maintain loving, intimate marriages, so she developed the six intimacy skills, helping over 150,000 women in 27 countries. She is a New York Times bestselling author of several relationship books, and her newest title is First Kill All the Marriage Counselors, Modern Day Secrets to Being Desired, Cherished, and Adored for Life. So Laura, thank you so much. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. I hope I'm safe here. (laughs) (laughs) I have to tell you, when I first, you know, my husband's a marriage counselor, and when I first heard your book title, I was not familiar with Shakespeare. And I was just like, whoa, you know, it was like shocking. And then I had heard, I had, um, read that article. We were, you were interviewed in Ami magazine. And they also had interviewed me about the, about marriage counseling go wrong what what to look after for you know to avoid bad therapy and so i had finally understood that also we, the shakespeare reference did you come up with that title or did your book publisher no i, I came up with it. <laughs> so apologies i'm no pilot okay. to anyone um but i it was really just uh out of my own uh experience of course personally finding that marriage counseling really kind of contributed to our problems, but also uh, in my position as a relationship coach over the last 17 years, I really had a, a front row seat to a lot of women's, the inside of their relationships and just heard so many, you know, story after story of, yeah, I went and the marriage counselor said to get divorced. Yeah. Uh, so it was really kind of horrifying to see all the damage that was getting done. But, you know, the, the title, it, you know, I did want to, ins- to shock people that was part of the intention but I was also trying to be playful it was a little bit of a joke it was Shakespeare it was a joke when he said to kill all the lawyers um so and I think humor is a great way to make people think about things differently and if things are going to change we have to think about them differently absolutely and and that's really why we wanted to invite you on the show we've never really had a guest on our podcast but we wanted to have you because you are bold and brave in talking to women about taking responsibility right on themselves. And we almost, you know, sometimes we're a little more gentle in our approach with asking people to take responsibility. And what we really liked about your approach is that you're really bold and you say it like it is like women, if you're going to constantly nag and shame and blame your husband, he's going to have an affair or crisis or whatever. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think for me, um, I was so clueless. I, it's so sad when I think about my earlier version of myself and my marriage. I just did not realize I was being disrespectful. And I didn't, I really thought he was the problem. He was the one that needed to improve. And it was hopeless because he wasn't trying to improve. He didn't want to work on the relationship. He didn't want to talk to me. So um, from that point of view, I had just zero power. I couldn't begin to create what I have now, you know, the, the kind of connection and playfulness and passion that we have now. So for me, it was just very empowering to learn like, oh, women are the keepers of the relationship. And if, if I wanted things to change, it it was up to me. I have great power. And just like with Spider-Man, I have great responsibility. So I believe we women do have a responsibility to learn the skills that contribute to intimacy. And we didn't get those sometimes. You know, a lot of a lot of women are from broken homes. I'm from a broken home. So the recipe I watched was a failed recipe. And uh, we didn't have Relationships 101 where I went to school. So and for me, it's just uh, the most basic thing that every woman needs because 
we are all going to want to have the kind of relationships where our husband is seeking out our company and he's um, just, my husband just knocks himself out to do things to delight me, you know, and uh, make me happy. The other recently he was, he pulled out his phone and he was like, oh, don't move. And he starts taking pictures of me like I'm a supermodel. I would be very, very I know. I was like, wow. So I'm unspeakably grateful for that outcome. And I just, I just know that any woman can have that if she's married to a good man and she gets trained in the skills that contribute to intimacy. Just like if you get trained to drive a car or make an omelet, you're going to have a better time with doing those, those things. Yes. And I know we both work to do that very much. So on our mission to educate people to do this, Shlomo really exclusively works with couples together. And I like that for those whose spouses are not willing to, you know, work on it together, you help women one on one. Were you going to ask? And we, and we, you know, one of the things when people call us and they say, you know, what can I do? My my husband doesn't want to. It's either the husband or the wife, but a lot of times it's the woman that calls. But my husband doesn't want to come to counseling, so we encourage them to do whatever they can to work on themselves and become aware of what they're doing to contribute to their relationship. But um, I was just picking up on one thing you said that if they're married to a good man. Um, mm-hmm. Do you find that there are situations where no matter what the wife does, the husband's not going to react in a way that is in a successful way? Well, there's very few, but yes, of course there are. Well, for me, what I say is safety comes first. And if you're not safe in your marriage, then um, it's, I, I say it's a divorce I endorse. So if he is physically abusive or if he is just uh, chronically, relentlessly uh, unfaithful, if he's not capable of being faithful, um, or if he has uh, an active addiction to drugs, alcohol, or gambling to where, uh, to where you're not safe, then those are the situations where I cannot promise great results um, because intimacy requires safety. Right. Definitely. I mean, you talk, right. that's also Yeah. I mean, we were thing. talking about, I mean, obviously those, those elements, but also the emotional safety as well. And I think that, you know, one, when one spouse tries to make the relationship more safe, even emotionally safe, you know, cutting out the criticism or the nagging or the blaming, um, that creates, that's, that's what allows for that ripple effect. That, that's how it allows for the husband to respond in a different way because when he's not feeling threatened, he can actually show up. As well, I couldn't agree with you more. That is just the wisest thing, what you just said there, because um, emotional safety, intimacy does have to have emotional safety to thrive, absolutely. And it's funny, I do have a lot of women saying, well, I had to, I have to divorce because he's uh, emotionally abusive or verbally abusive. And what we see is that when she institutes the intimacy skills and brings respect and, and vulnerability and relinquishes inappropriate control um, and, and the other skills, that, that that emotional or verbal abuse clears up. So it's really not the intractable problem that it appears to be. It's actually something that she's contributing to unwittingly. She doesn't even realize she's being disrespectful, just like I didn't have any concept that I was being disrespectful. Yeah, I was interrupting him. I was rolling my eyes. I was contradicting him. But I I wasn't disrespectful. I just couldn't see (laughs) how I was doing it. But as soon as I made it emotionally safe on my side of the street, of course, he responded to me very differently in a much better, more tender, you know, his natural desire to make me ridiculously happy returned. Just like um, all husbands uh, have that desire that I call it the hero gene to make their wives happy. But they, if they have to defend themselves against her ongoing criticism and complaints uh, and uh, disrespect, then that's going to supersede his hero gene coming out. Do you get a lot of flack for talking to women about taking responsibility for this? Well, I do. I do because, um, and I think, I think part of the problem is as, as with my marriage, I was already so exhausted and I felt like I had worked so hard to save my marriage and I had worked hard, but I was doing the wrong work. You know, I was like trying to have a state of the union address with them all the time on the couch. Like, let's talk about our relationship, which is just let's have every husband know he's in trouble and he just wants to get away. And it's not going to lead to him saying how beautiful and special and wonderful I am, which is what I really wanted to have happen. So I was exhausted. And when I, I think when women here are like, you know, I was delivering it. I'm like, hey, great news. You are the keeper of the relationship and you have all the power. And they hear it as like, oh, 
I have to do all the work and he's not going to do anything. And it's not that at all. It's that um, they were doing too much. I was doing too much. And if you do less, if you relax, if you let your husband take care of you, if you stop acting like his mother, if you stop buying his socks and underwear and making his doctor's appointments, you're going to have a lot more time for yourself and to do things that you enjoy. So, I mean, one of the first places we start usually is I'm like, yeah, stop, you know, do less and receive more uh, from him and receive it graciously and gratefully. And that is, that makes a huge difference right there. Wow. Because ultimately the husband wants, the husband wants to give to the wife and it's just, uh, if you don't let give him that opportunity, then that muscle kind of uh, Atrophy. atrophies. Yeah. And- yeah, it it does. And it is amazing. Um, we women really can have a hard time with that sometimes. I struggled with it at first. I'm, I've got better habits now, thankfully. But I mean, my husband would, I'd wake up in the morning, you know, with bad hair and he'd say, you look beautiful. And I'd be like, no, I don't shut and stop it. I, my hair's a mess. Or, you know, I just totally contradict, like even a simple compliment, I couldn't receive it. Or he would, yeah, he would say, hey, I want to take you out to dinner. And I'd be like, I already defrosted the meat. You know, like, that's not practical. Like, we can't do that. <laughs> so I was just rejecting him right and left without realizing. And then I'd be mad he wasn't very romantic. Oh, I love that. I know um, Harville Hendricks, Shlomo's an imago therapist. And Dr. Harville Hendricks, who's the founder, wrote a book called Receiving Love. Because he found that he could teach, right? Correct me if I'm wrong. That, How did that book Well, that at some point in a relationship, even all the great things you can do to work on the relationship, if, if one person is incapable of receiving love, then you know, all the good doesn't actually penetrate. You have to be a, you know, a receptacle to be able to receive that love from your partner. Mm-hmm. And, and that sometimes, you know, you can make a lot of effort, but if there's no receiver on the other end, it just doesn't hit the mark. And you still can wind up in that same frustrating place. I think he was seeing a lot of, people unable to actually receive the love that was finally being expressed. And in his own relationship, I mean, it was based on his own relationship that he wrote the book. Yeah. that's. But I think that, you know, what you're saying about the um, emotional abuse, because sometimes we talk about this and people get really upset. I think coming from a woman, it's a little bit more powerful (laughs) that you're saying that, that you've seen how it can stop by, by you just changing. And obviously, you know, there's no excuse, you know, there's no excuse for, for hurtful behavior, but there is, is a context for it. And if we can change the context, then the behavior can change. It doesn't mean that the marriage needs to be written off or that this person is a, you know, an emo, you know, emotionally abusive. It's the, once you throw out the word abuse, I mean, even therapists, they get very, uh, Nervous. Nervous. And they said, how can you say that it can be fixed? And how can you, you know, even say it can, you know, there's a way, to, way out. So. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, in fact, one of the interesting things that I've discovered um, in, on my journey is that women are actually the only ones that use the phrase emotional abuse. Yeah, right. I've never heard a man say that. And, um, what, you know, and I've, I've inquired. I, and what's interesting, and here's how I... Um, I, the lens that I look at this through is that when I was first married, I was a rageaholic. And I, I mean, I really would rip into my husband and just try to tear him down as much as I could up one side, down the other, say all the hurtful, mean, awful things that I could. And I'm not proud of that, obviously, but I am happy to say that through practicing the intimacy skills, my urge, my compulsion to do that was lifted. And I haven't had a rage episode in, um, gosh, you know, 17 or 18 years. So I'm happy about that. But um, I knew from my own marriage that I had been an emotional abuser, right? If you want to use that phrase. And my husband never would even refer to it that way. He would just be like, yeah, sometimes my wife gets mad at me. (laughs) Right? (laughs) Totally totally different phrasing for it. And so that was part of the light bulb for me was hearing women say, he's emotionally abusive. And then I would also, and and I remember one woman in particular said, yeah, my husband called me this name and that name and the other name. And I can't even repeat the names on the show. They were that. And I was like, kind of shocked, like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do with this? This is when I very first started out. And, um, and then I just kind of paused because I was trying to think of a response. And she said, so I told him he was a blah, 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 blah. 
And I was like, oh, it's a two-way street. They're emotionally abusing each other. And uh, just like with little kids, right? You know, one kid will punch the other one, and the, and the kid will go, hey, he punched me. And it's like, well, yeah, you just punched him too. But they're not attend- They're not focused on that. They're just focused on the pain of that they just got hit. Mm-hmm. And so, um, and because we women... Um, we are, I think I can say this, uh, we are more emotional because they did a study at the University of Toronto recently and they discovered that, so I'm glad you guys are sitting down for this, that women are more emotional than men, right? So there's research money well spent. <laughs> and, uh, because of that, I think these things uh, do have a, a different impact on us as women than, than maybe they do on the men. And so they're a little more um is it fair about it, right? They're just getting a little more like, oh yeah, she was mean to me. Mm-hmm. And we're like, he abused me. And we make it a little more dramatic and kind of bring in some, um, I call it NET, needless emotional turmoil about mm-hmm. um, those kinds of fights. They are, you know, uh, I, I always uh, joke about how there's no such thing as, as, you know, people say you have to learn how to fight fair. Well, I, I think it's such a thing. I mean, that, that's why they call it fighting, right? You're trying to you're trying you're trying to be destructive and tear down that other person in that moment, and, and it's not it's not good. It's not right. It's Nobody not productive. That. Not productive, of course. Not productive at all, and it doesn't keep the end goal in mind, which is to connect rather than you know to be in a state of disconnect. So it's like, what's your end goal? Is it to dump and be right, or is it to ultimately connect and build a great relationship? And I think also just society, you know, like I noticed every single TV show always has sarcasm with regards to marriage and the husband is mean to his wife or the wife is mean. And it's like funny. So I think also we don't necessarily realize what becomes just a typical joke. We don't realize how damaging that is. Like, you know, or girlfriends going out for drinks to kind of get away, they all start talking and dumping about their spouses. Like that's not, you know something that's going to help them, right, in the long run. So. No, male bashing is incredibly destructive. And I didn't really see that in my early marriage. I thought the same thing, like, oh, it's funny. Men are stupid. Men are immature. Men are lazy. You know, right. oh, it's hilarious. They're slobby. Um, and uh, it really, it did, you know, spending that evening with my girlfriends, male bashing, just made me come home and think, ew, right? Like, he's why would I want to be married to this? And I am married to this and I'm, I'm really grateful for that now. So keeping my uh, focus on the things that I want to have increase versus the things that I don't want more of has really made a big difference too, just in terms of um, refocusing my view on all the positive attributes, the things that I fell in love with about my husband. Uh, Gosh, I, I just can't say enough about that. I feel like that has really been, um, the, the golden ticket into the kind of marriage that I wanted to have when I said I do. That's amazing. It's just, it, we just really commend you for just taking your experience and putting it into something that people can, you know, and having faith that people can change and the expectation that women, you know, and men oh, can yeah. change and make this difference. I think right. that's Cause a, a lot of phenomenal. people, as you said in the beginning that we experience that we get calls all the time for people who've had marriage counseling gone wrong. Someone, I had a couple that said, you're a seventh therapist. You know, and, and luckily they're still around because uh, as you said, a lot of people, a lot of times people encourage people to get divorced. They're not trained. To, they, I mean, they're not they're adequately trained, trained, they're not trained. Um, or they don't necessarily believe in, in marriage or, you know, it's, let's decide whether you should stay together or not. Without even, even seeing the other spouse. Them. Yeah. So it, it's very, it can be very destructive. So it's good that, you know, we need more people out there who are giving messages of hope that things can be different and that there is a better way. And also so being brave you know. enough to really call out those, you know, therapists that are working with couples and making the marriage and destroying the marriage, which, you know, we've done, but it's hard because he, being that he is a therapist, you know. Right. Therapists don't like <laughs> Therapists don't like it. <laughs> I can see where that would make you really unpopular. Yeah. You. People like that. The therapists all complain that people, the, uh, but his I got tons of emails from people that, oh, this is exactly, this, this happened to me, unfortunately. Right. right. Uh, yeah. people, re- people relate to it, but there are good therapists out there, but there are a lot of people, Absolutely. you know, you want to go to somebody who knows what, has expertise and is going to help you reach your goal. Yeah, absolutely. We, we like the concept of a marriage mentor. Um, so, and since we only serve women, we don't serve couples. Right. Um, we, what we do is, uh, so all the, all the coaches in my organization, for instance, 
mm-hmm. they have had their own transformation. So they have gone from um, being on the verge of divorce or really just kind of a dead marriage where they live under the same roof, but there's no um, emotional connection and passion and um, just that, that wonderful companionship that you get from a good marriage. And they have turned it into uh, something that is worth having and worth, um, worth bragging about, I guess I'll say. And so they're able to say, you know, here's what I did. And it's real specific along those lines. But, uh, you know, I, I agree that I know that marriage counselors mostly got into the business to help people and they mean well and they have good intentions. Right. Um, and so it is, it is tragic that so many are not trained. And then, um, one of the things that I hear about that just breaks my heart every time is this couple will go into marriage counseling and then the counselor will invite them to see what's wrong. And the woman goes through and says, well, I don't think I can trust him. He's not, he can't go in bed. You know, she goes through all these things that are incredibly disrespectful in front of a stranger. And she has just dug her hole so much deeper just by doing that. Right. Like all the things, it's almost like the equivalent of the man saying, well, I don't think I love her. And I never really did. Mm. she would just be crushed and she doesn't see that she's crushing him just as much um, by doing that kind of thing. So that's one example of the things that we hear about. I'm sure you would never do, but unfortunately some poorly trained therapists are doing that and it's just a most damaging thing. So uh, everybody that's listening, don't do that. Don't go to therapy and say everything is wrong with your husband in front of a stranger. And that's that's the importance of having a safe process that really makes sure that they can express what they need to, but in a way that is respectful and, and safe so that the other person doesn't feel shamed. Yeah, exactly. One of the things we do is encourage them not to even tell their husbands uh, that they are learning the intimacy skills and that if they have any complaints, they could bring that to us and we'll hold that for them. <laughs> and then what they're, the face that they're showing, you know, what they're bringing to the husband is um, the action of respect, right? Just like love is a decision, respect is a decision. And so we'll hold the things that, you know, are grossing you out about your husband or that you can't believe he's doing. And when you show up to him, you're just showing that respect, making that decision. Interesting. And what would you say to husbands who, let's say you had a husband that, I mean, I know they don't, you don't work with husbands, but if, if you had a message, you know, you're saying that the woman needs to take responsibility. Is the husband off the hook or? Yeah. Uh, in my book, First Kill of the Marriage Counselors, I tell them they can read page 72. So that'd be good for them. <laughs> and the rest of it is really for the wife. So it sounds like um, women can work with you and your coaches one-on-one. Is that how you do it? Yes, we, um, we have a number of um, different ways that we serve women. So one of them is definitely private coaching, mm-hmm. um, where you talk to someone who has already transformed her marriage, and has gone through um, extensive training to become a relationship coach uh, in the style of the surrendered wife and first kill all the marriage counselors, where we really, um, we believe that every woman is really the expert on her own life. So we don't really have any um, advice. It sounds kind of funny. We don't have any authority to tell her what she should do, but we just have our own experience to share and some skills that, you know, if she'd like to learn them, we can assist her in applying them. We can encourage her. We, um, we stand for her marriage and for it being great and amazing and exhilarating. Um, and we listen and bear witness and we also acknowledge her for her progress, but we're not really there to tell her what to do. Right. So I think right. where sometimes the therapist model might be, right. they are encouraging them to stay married or not stay married. You know, like maybe she get divorced. We don't have that authority. So you just empower them to get in touch with what they want to do and be the best they can for their marriage. That's exactly. Cool. And could you briefly uh, share with the, our listeners the six, uh, your six intimacy skills? Right. I mean, I know it's a, uh, so there's a lot you wrote a whole book about it so but if you want to yeah, yeah, yeah. summarize the main points no i want everyone to know what they are actually so the first one is about um replenishing your spirit by practicing uh good self-care by which i don't mean eight hours of sleep and five fruits and vegetables and 30 minutes of cardio what i mean is doing at least three things a day for your own joy like, like the way a child is attracted to a ball these are the things that just make you so you can't stop smiling so for me like i love to play volleyball um i i love to um walk and but uh, I, it might just be a hot bath i love to take a nap or talk to my girlfriend on the phone or my sister so it can be really simple things but um, just really carving out the time 
for you so that you're not just always giving to everyone else and then becoming depleted and exhausted and thinking your husband's just the biggest idiot on the planet, which is what happens if you don't practice self-care. Um, so that's number one. We have to do that one in order to do any of the other intimacy skills because you won't have the energy if you don't do that one. So number two is to relinquish inappropriate control. A surrender wife doesn't, um, she knows she can't control anyone else. So she doesn't tell her husband how to drive or what to do at work or um, how to dress or what to you know, eat because she focuses on her own happiness instead. And that in turn really improves the intimacy. And number three is about restoring respect um, by um, expecting the best outcome. So instead of um, expecting him to mess up, you are holding out an expectation for your husband that he is um, wise and uh, thoughtful and competent and your uh, your words and your deeds match those expectations. The next one is uh, receiving graciously. We talked about that one a little bit about receiving gifts, compliments, and help with just a simple thank you and a smile instead of you shouldn't have or I'll just do it myself. Um, and that is the essence of femininity, by the way, a receptive woman is very feminine and she, that makes her very attractive. It like 10 X is your attraction level. And then the next one is about revealing your heart, which is um, choosing vulnerability. Uh, even when you're angry, you're actually, if you're angry at someone you're intimate with, you are also hurt. So you may choose the hurt by saying ouch, or you may express, um, you might say like, I miss you instead of you never spend any time with me. It's a much more vulnerable approach. And the final one, maybe the most powerful intimacy skill of all is about refocusing your view with gratitude. So it's really focusing on the things that you want uh, instead of the things that you don't want. And um, and here we have the, the power of the, I call it the spouse fulfilling prophecy, which is really the change your husband uh, skill, if there is one, <laughs> because uh, uh, we find that if you, um, you know, a lot of times a wife will say, he always loses his temper, but no one always does anything. Mm -hmm. So um, you could just as uh, honestly focus on the times that he doesn't lose his temper and say, you never lose your temper, right? So it's just about um, choosing the one that serves you instead of the one that doesn't. Mm, beautiful. Well, Laura, thank you so much. We, it's, it's, we're definitely going to encourage that um, women, re it's like your blog and your material is just such great um, regular reading to do in order to encouragement. Yeah. Encouragement in, in, in order, right. To encourage and create this marriage, you know, of your dreams. And it's, it's like, it's, it was just a really nice, um, change for us to have you on our podcast because really we're we're very selective like like I said we've never had anybody on because of the reason that many times you know what another marriage professional does is not in line with our very serious value that marriage comes first we never ever encourage divorce Shlomo never tells a couple what to do to stay to go it's not about that so we're very cautious by you know what we Right? We're selective. <laughs> <laughs> With my, what we put out there because we really do believe that there is a lot of information out there that can be more harmful than helpful. So we wanted to get your message out um, and share it. And it's helpful for, you know, if, for people who are, don't have a willing, you know, willing spouse and have to do it on their own. And even if your spouse is willing to work on it, it can only enhance it because when one person changes in the relationship, it has an effect on the other. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, first of all, I'm so honored that you had me on. I really, I'm just, I'm flattered. I, I can't believe that I got invited to you to be on the podcast. <laughs> so um, that's really I'm wonderful. I'm a marriage counselor. Focusing on the positive, being able to receive, um, you know, looking, trying to catch your spouse doing something right as opposed to looking at the negative and yeah, I mean, it's, it's, all, it's very all very important. powerful. And these little, these, they're little things, but I mean, they're big, they're, they're little things that are really big things because they can have a profound impact as you've shared your own story and your, with us that it makes a huge difference. So, you know, those of you who are listening who don't think that you change, doing these, you know, little changes can make a big difference. It can make a huge difference in your relationship. And we, we have seen it. We do believe that. Yeah, I mean, if I can do it, believe me, I was a complete mess. So if I can do it, oh my gosh, anybody can do it. Oh, that's so inspiring. Well, Laura, thank you so much. And we are excited to share this information. Oh, yes. And 
the website is, go ahead. Sure. Well, I have a special uh, webinar going right now that, um, you know, I invite you to, uh, to attend and you can get it at getcherished.com slash, uh, um, can this marriage be saved? <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Getchurch.com slash can this marriage be saved? And it's called get, how to get respect, reconnect and rev up your love life. And it does uh, do an in-depth, it's an in-depth um, study on the first intimacy, well, the second intimacy skill, relinquishing inappropriate control. It gives you really specific cheat phrases to use with your husband to get a much better response. Awesome. Right. We look forward to sending people there. Yeah. Laura, thank you again. And thank we'll you. talk to you soon. All right. Bye-bye. Okay, it's been Bye-bye. a pleasure. Thank you. We hope you've enjoyed listening to today's topic. We'll be back again to focus on another topic that is sure to help you with your marriage. For any questions or concerns, please email us at info at the with best wishes for your relationship success. 